Because once he spoke, it just keeps traveling, keeps traveling. Scientists are amazed. Well, look at there. We've, we, saw, we found a star estuary where stars are still being formed. Well, well of course you did. <laughs> well, of course you did. You didn't know that. <laughs> so let's pray and ask that God's word would catch up with us. You know, we're going at light speed and we need his word to catch up with us, pass us and hold us in his arms. Lord, we joyfully come before you and ask you to breathe upon us with your word. Breathe upon us with your Holy Spirit. Because, Lord, unless you do, your word is dead. Because our flesh, mind, and heart cannot perceive, receive, nor understand spiritual concepts from a different world. So we ask you to breathe upon us and make your world known to us, your kingdom known to us, your heart known to us, your mind known to us, and your joy and your peace that comes with it. And most of all, Lord, your abiding, loving presence manifest that to us in the midst of your word. In Jesus' great and powerful and precious name I pray, amen, amen. We began chapter 22 in our study in the book of Revelation, and last week we made it in our little canoe right in the river. <laughs> and that was about as far as we got because we had to look at the river and see what the river was and that the river of life is supposed to be flowing out of us, supposed to be rivers of living water coming out of our soul, streams flowing out of our soul. That can't happen unless we're so overflowing with God's presence that we just burst I can tell you there's been times and seasons in my life I just thought I was, I was just a geyser going off of God's great love and his presence and his mind and his heart and his fellowship. So, the scripture says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life. I love that statement that he showed me. You're not going to see anything spiritual unless you're willing to listen to him and ask him, will you show me? Everything that takes place, everything that Scripture talks about, everything that's in the spiritual world, we're supposed to be holding our hand. Oh, Lord, would you show me? Would you show me? He loves giving us a tour of his kingdom and letting his secrets be known. His heart is for us, not against us. I love it that the water is clear as crystal. Proceeding from the throne of God, there's only one place living water can come from, and that's the throne. Why do you think it's important that we connect ourselves to Jesus who sits on the throne? And something else about the throne. In the Revelation, which we've already covered, where were the saints located at in their prayers? Right under the throne. This is the ones that have already passed away. They were right under the throne, and they were having a conversation with the Lord. And, and I don't know what direction they were looking, but it says that they were under the throne, and they were crying, How long, Lord? How long? How long? And he said, Just a little while longer. And he gave them some white robes to wear. There's some communication going on. There's some interaction going on. There's some passing of provision going on. There's total consciousness going on. And that's with the dead. Jesus took over the place of the dead and put even greater chasms in it and carried that part of the place of the dead right under his throne that belongs to him. The prophets are there, Elijah's there, Ezekiel's there, and oh my goodness, the bowls of the saints and all their prayers sit right before their throne. And there's rivers of living water flowing out of it. We've already seen the earth destroyed and the heavens destroyed and they were talking about a new earth a new heaven God making everything absolutely new it's not just a remodel or a remake I was reading in one of the passages in the Old Testament and it says and God will show up and he will melt the earth with his breath <laughs> uh, well yeah they got it right because <laughs> it says everything is going to be melted away in a fever and heat well God has to get rid of the old so he can bring the new he has to get rid of the contaminated contaminated part so he can bring that which is not contaminated and he wants so much to bring that which is not contaminated which brings up the thought are we contaminated and the reason we come to church is so that we can begin to fight the infection I had three surgeries not too long ago, over a period of probably three months, and made it through those uh, pretty good. But in the midst of that, I uh, got a staph infection internally, internally in the surgery room. 
which also was detected Mercer in it. And that infection took my whole system down to where I wanted to sleep and I couldn't move and I couldn't think. And our relationship with God, we can't be hanging out where there used to be a cesspool, waiting in it, and not expect to catch an infection. Infection slows us down. Infection makes us where we can't think. That's being a mixture. If if we are a mixture, God never he, He's never like mixtures. And there's a problem. Most of the church today, because it's turning away from Jesus, it's becoming lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It's becoming <laughs> like the world. As a matter of fact, most churches are telling their congregants that uh, we must become relevant to the world. And we mustn't become relevant to the world. We must become relevant to Jesus Christ because he is the one that draws all men to himself. We must be like him, not like the world. We're supposed to model what it's like to be like him. So when God comes, he comes to destroy all those things that are not his model. And that's why we come and train and try to become disciples because he's coming to destroy everything that doesn't fit his model. Anyone who doesn't fit his model. And he gives you ample choice. He gives you ample choice. There's nothing in Scripture, not one verse, not one indication of once saved, always saved. I think that's such a sad doctrine. I came from that doctrine, being a good Southern Baptist, and wanted to believe that doctrine, but I couldn't find it anywhere in Scripture. Instead, the whole New Testament is written to Christians and giving us warning, and we're going to find another warning here in the book of Revelation that our name could be even removed from the book of life, and wow, somebody else said that too, like Paul. Somebody else said that too, like Jesus. Somebody else said that too in the study of the book of Revelation when Jesus is talking to one of the churches that I'll scratch your name out of my book. And my point is, is if he's making everything new and everything is crystal clear, our approach to God is try to become that and fit that model. Our whole purpose in studying scripture and walking in the spirit is to become pure. I find many people, especially, you know, I guess I'm a baptismatic or a penny, penny Baptist or, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a, Heinz, I'm a cross breed here. But I, I, I've seen lots of error that's occurred on both sides. And part of that error is that it's all about spiritual gifts. No, it's all about Jesus Christ. It's, it, but the Holy Spirit is going to help us to know Jesus because the scripture says the Holy Spirit came to shine the light on Jesus. He came to empower us, to raise us up out of the deadness of our lives. I'll paraphrase that passage of scriptures. Just like Jesus Christ was raised up out of the place of the dead by the Holy Spirit, so your mortal bodies also will be raised up. And it's not talking about the last days. It's talking about your mortal body, not your immortal body. It's talking about you right now being raised up out of the deadness of not knowing him, the deadness of not following him, the deadness of not hearing him. And the Holy Spirit is the only one that can bring us. Someone that's dead is not conscious that Jesus is even walking next to them. They might have read it in a book. Here, here's, here's the thing. You get an instruction manual. And it's how to fly. And you read it and read it and you read it and you quote it and you talk about it. And, you know, you got Hezekiah 43 in there. And, and then it says if you set the flaps and you do this and, and you can get to 20,000, 30,000 feet with your plane and all this stuff. And it's just an instruction manual. Until you climb in the cockpit with the Holy Spirit, it don't fly. The Holy Spirit wants to take us into Jesus' presence. The Holy Spirit wants to train us to be like Jesus. The Holy Spirit wants to help us become sanctified, purified. We must work on that so that we're welcomed with open arms. So that it is a great joy and we hear, Well done, good and faithful servant. Well, 
If you hear those words, it means you were good. If you hear those words, it means you were faithful. If you hear those words, it means you were a servant. What if you weren't faithful? What if you weren't good? And what if you weren't a servant? Are you going to hear those words? The only one that can get us into that position is the Holy Spirit. He is the one that is sent to help sanctify us and prepare us for our coming King. He is the one that's going to train us. He's like the groomsman that comes and, and trains us of how to dress and how to be arrayed and how to be purified. Yeah, you, you know, the groomsman was the best friend of the groom. He would go to the bride nearly a year in advance and he, he would be sent with gifts from the bridegroom, a list of all the special recipes, and show her the special recipes, and, and, and all these bathing oils. Now, your husband wants you to bathe in this oil six times a day until your skin smells like this. So he gives all the understanding to her of what to do and prepare for the coming of the great king. So she's not scrambling. He sends clothes to her in robes. of, And Jesus sends clothes to us. And Holy Spirit wants to clothe us with his righteousness that he sends. And his purification. We can't, we, can't get, we can't be trained and we can't get into that clothing. And we can't become sanctified and pure without the Holy Spirit. And the whole thing about this new heaven and new earth is completely, totally new. With the exception of you and me. And Jesus and God and those who belong to him that are in the place of the dead. It's a completely new thing. That I, I don't think there's English words or any words. There's no human words to be able to describe all the beauty of this place. Can you imagine exploring? And right now we're with our telescopes. We're looking way out there. Way out there. And they tell us, okay, this picture is uh, 20,000 years in the past. <laughs> this is what it looks like. We're looking at 20,000 years in the past. Well, how would you like to catch the elevator up to the throne room and, and catch the escalator over to the next uh, Alpha Centauri, you know? And it gets you there that quick. We're struggling in slow motion with little rockets trying to make the Mars mission or something. And God wants us to be explorers of his great universe. He wants us to watch him as when the spirit was there, the spirit of wisdom. He said, I was there when he stretched out his hand and drew a line in the sand and told the ocean not to come any further. I was there when he pushed up the mountain. I was there when he... Can you imagine being there and watching God make all these new things? It's a newness and it's a fresh start. And so shouldn't we be excited about getting dressed and arrayed? Shouldn't we be excited about being prepared for that? Shouldn't that be our aim in this life instead of the senseless aims that we have and what futility, that, futility <laughs> or was I right the first time? <clears throat> so we have the water proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. I find that interesting. At the throne of the Lamb, the throne of the Father, the water's proceeding from both of those areas. Why do you think Jesus was always telling people, pray to your Father, our Father which art in heaven. He wants us also to commune with the Father. Matter of fact, Philip asked Jesus, he said, uh, well, I, I, he, he got... Jesus was talking about having seen the Father and he would show him to him. And Philip said, well, show us the Father. And Jesus made the statement, Philip, have I been with you so long that you haven't seen? He, he was saying that he was the Father. And that if we look steady on into Jesus, we're going to see the heart of the Father. Why? Because he's also transparent. In the middle of the streets on either side of the river was a tree of life which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. I find it interesting that the whole Bible starts off, the first two chapters, it's got the tree in it. And then it disappears. And we don't see it reappear until the last two chapters of the Bible. It reappears. The tree of life. There's some comments, there's some visions, there's some dreams about it 
But it was there. It was there in the garden that God had personally planted himself. And what would that look like if God personally planted himself something? I find it interesting that he is an architect, he's an engineer, he's a craftsman, and he can speak and create something, but he did something different when he made the garden. It says he planted it. He didn't just speak it. He was speaking it and doing something else with it. And he did something else different when he formed man. He personally formed and fashioned. He just didn't speak a word. Everything else, he just spoke a word. So there's some very special things about mankind and very special things about the garden and the tree. In Genesis, it's saying that there was all these trees in the garden and they were for the healing of the nations. And then it stops there and it's verbiage in the Hebrew and then it, then it says, now in the midst of it was the tree of life and the tree of good and evil. It didn't talk about those two being made. And, and the others came up out of the ground. And these two, it has nothing mentioned about them coming up out of the ground. Isn't that something? And now, here in the book of Revelation, you know, in the book of Genesis, we saw the tree of good and evil. Here in this picture, tree of good and evil no longer exists. God has burned it up. And when he recreates everything new, there's only one tree, and it's a tree of life. Only one tree. And it alone has the leaves that heals the nation. So there's been a great modification to the order of the universe of what would maintain it, because the, all the trees collectively in the garden would give off their fruit in all the different seasons. Now, they're not giving off their fruit. Instead, there's one tree giving off the fruit in all of its seasons, and there's one tree providing leaves, and there's one tree providing healing. I love it that Jesus says he is the tree. He says, I'm the tree. Yeah. I'm the manna. I'm the way. I mean, Jesus has 237 titles and probably more. You could probably fill me in on a couple more. And that's how many I've come up with so far of ranks and titles that he carries, just like the Queen of England has, I don't know, what, 36 or something like that. Jesus is a little ahead of her. <coughs> how do you put a tree in the middle of the street and on either side of the river? I shared a little bit of that with you, of what I saw in a dream one time of the the tree of life branching out about a mile across and the river of life underneath it. You could go underneath it. There's like cities built on the side of it and houses and uh, it goes up for thousands of feet. Now, we don't know how tall this tree is. There's no description in it, but I know it covers both sides of the river. It goes and covers both sides of the river. I don't know how significant it is, but for something in me says it's significant that it covers both sides of the river. It's significant that it reaches both banks. Now, I don't know the significance of the banks, but it's significant that there's two banks. Maybe that requires some more looking into. I would submit to you there's the bank that the father's on and there's a the bank that the son's on. And the way you get the two together is in the tree of life through the Spirit. But that's speculation on my part. That's not scriptural. Let's go on here. Talking a little bit more about the river. Some passages of scripture that talk about that. Then he brought me back to the door of the house and beheld water was flying from under the threshold of the house towards the east. This river starts under the throne and flows through the house. I love that. I love to visit his house. Yes, I know it's also in the middle of the street in the city. The city is 2,500 miles high and 2,500 miles wide, and it'd be like it was sitting on the face of the United States. And yeah, a river's flowing down through it, but there's a river directly in his house. There's a river that comes out from under his throne. There's, I, I, I don't know if your mind can capture that or not, that everything is coming from that one point. From that one point. There is no other origin for life. There's no other origin 
river brings life. A river brings refreshing. A river brings that, that dried, tired out heart and the desert existence that we have. A river of life brings that. And there's, there's always more than enough water. Matter of fact, one of the guys is going out and measuring. He wades out and with a rod and he's up to his knees. He's gone out 15... Hundred stratas, I think, or something like that. I'm probably wrong, and y'all can write to me and correct me if you'd like. And he goes out another distance like that. He's gone. He's gone out probably a mile, and he finds it's a river that cannot be passed, a river that cannot be passed, and he's drowning. I find it interesting that something that comes from God just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding, and it should expand so that it can cover everything in our life. We need the freshness and pureness of His holy water to cover every aspect of our nature, every aspect of our purposes, every aspect of our life. And we can count on it that it will if we will only steadily move upward towards the throne. It was flowing under the threshold of the house towards the east from the house facing east and the water was flowing down from under from the right side of the house and from the south of the altar. Now, I've measured all that out and looked at all that stuff and I'd find that really cool and I could speak for a week just on that particular passage that are taking place because it has to do with where the altar's at. What's it, why is there an altar there? What, what does that signify? And... Why would there be an altar in the city? Well, just like there's all kinds of memorials, there's going to be a memorial altar there in the new heaven and new earth of what Jesus accomplished. Now, I know, I hear somebody saying, or have heard somebody say, well, this is talking about Ezekiel's temple when it's built during a thousand year reign. And I, I can't dispute that. I'm not there during that time. I do know that it's talking about water coming out from under the throne. And I do know when it talks about the thousand year reign, there's nothing about water coming out from under the throne in the book of Revelation during the thousand year reign. So you'll have to figure that part out. I'm sure you're more intelligent and smarter in finding those things out than I am, whether it's Ezekiel's reign. But I do know at the end when the new one comes that there's a river of life that flows out from under the throne. That's what the book of Revelation says. But the book also goes through the thousand year reign and Jesus coming as a king. But it doesn't talk about in the book of Revelation of the water pouring out from under the throne at that time. However, I do receive some of the speculation and won't dispute with some of my esteemed colleagues. But I do Make this statement. There's a river whose strings make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. Do you want to live in a city? Do you want to live in His kingdom? You realize the kingdom of God, when Jesus showed up and He began to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. After His death, He said that it has come and you can enter it that we could enter the kingdom of God. I think that his city limits, there's a city limit sign that's out here somewhere. It's far beyond any structures, is it not? I know Fort Worth has its city limits pushed all the way out to include Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, which is 30 miles from them because they didn't want to miss the tax money off of that. None of their buildings. They, go, they went through about eight other cities to get to it so they could get the tax money. Just followed the freeway. Okay, this is within our city limits. We don't know how far God's city limits extend, but I do know this. There's no happiness in this life without the river flowing in you, without it flowing over you, without it flowing through you. And, of course, we've got our muck and all that stuff. It's the only thing that will wash the muck out of us. God wants to make our heart glad. Do you need some gladness in your life? Do you, you need some gladness? I, I remember that commercial, Man from Glad, Man from Glad. <laughs> I always used to play with that in my head, uh, thinking, man, we need, to, if that was a spiritual man, we need it, Man from Glad. But what did the Man from Glad do? He washed things and cleaned things. <laughs> and your heart will be so glad when it's washed and cleaned. And the only thing that washed and clean it is this river. And the good thing about this river is a fast-running river. 
See, we have a tendency to leak out toxic poisons, and so this river is moving so fast, it can carry them on downstream, away from us, so that we can still get, while we're changing, while we're metaphorically being changed by the Spirit and by the Word of God, and factually being changed and transformed, I know many of you really personally, really deeply, and there's been such great changes that have occurred within you since you started since you first tasted the first little taste of the spring, you get just a taste of the spring that makes you thirsty for the real thing in this life. God wants to present that to you, but he also wants to remind you the more this river you drink, the gladder your soul and your life will become here in this life. Scripture makes the statement. It gives us a command. Rejoice in everything. Rejoice in all things. How many? all things and if we, we you can't rejoice unless your heart's glad if your heart's glad no matter what the sorrow that comes if the heart's glad there can be rejoicing that can only happen if you continually drink from the living presence of jesus christ of the water flowing out from under the throne and he offers that daily he offers that liberally to us for transformation i showed you this picture in our last session i love it because it's got the it's got this whole universe down here. <laughs> the whole thing is flooded with his water, in my opinion. Why? Because there is no life. This is a river of life. And all life that God's going to create comes come out of that river of life. And there's some passages of Scripture that kind of bear out that. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, and the other half towards the western sea. And it will be summer as well as winter. Now, some have said, well, this is during a thousand-year reign. But there again, I take you back to the book of Revelation. During a thousand-year reign, it does not talk about there being a river of life flowing out from under the throne. However, there is much, much verbiage about it being uh, talked about in, in the new heaven and the new earth. However, I'm, I'm bouncing you back and forth. I'm doing that on purpose because I'm giving you some theologians what they say and, and trying to balance it with Scripture. One thing that we found out, there's no comment in the new heaven and new earth that there's a sea. It's a, it's a landmass, one landmass without a sea, but it's got a river. Where's the river flowing to? What's it going to make? Those waters have to be captured, and these waters bring life. There's one passage that talks about it even clearing out the swamps, even cleaning up everything. But there again, what is there to clear up if it's a new heaven and a new earth? See, I'm, I'm letting you toy with this from both sides of the playing field as to whether it is or isn't. What we do know is it flows out. Let's go on here. Revelation 22, verses 6 and 7. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. Wow. Can you imagine? This is, uh, do you realize that Jesus has one personal angel, his personal angel, and Jesus has sent his personal angel, and Jesus' personal angel is talking to John. He's talking to John saying, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets. If you look in the Greek, there's this, uh, there's this connotation, and it's even transcribed in many translations. The Lord God of the spirits of the holy prophets. But it's not put in a sense in past sense of some spirits in the grave. It's put in the sense of them being apart and alive with the living God. It's put in a sense of the holy prophets. You know, you know, we, we, we don't we don't put any stock in prophets today. Most people do not. They kind of well, I don't know about that stuff. But did you realize Jesus is your personal prophet? When the, that's something else about the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit speaks through prophecy, it says that it's a voice of Jesus. So if the Holy Spirit decides to move upon somebody to give a prophecy, that's a voice of Jesus that's in our midst. 
How important is it to have the voice of Jesus in our midst? And it says all the holy prophets. Now, what, what does holy mean? Those who separated themselves to live for the Lord, listen to the Lord, and yield their life to the Lord. His hand-picked agents. Now, I have met some people that they made a choice to separate themselves out to the Lord. However, they weren't given the office of a prophet, and Jesus didn't separate them out from the world. They chose to separate them out. The prophets, Jesus, went to them and handpicked them, and will you be separate to me? And he put them on a mission, a real mission to bring his word. Yeah, you know, I look at the church turning south today, and moving away from God and voting whether they're going to have homosexual pastors and voting whether they're going to do all those things and accept the ways of the land and all that stuff. If it was a man of God that was a prophet in there, he would come up and prophesy against that and God's judgment would fall upon that. I believe the office still exists. It's my personal opinion. I don't believe it was done away with. But for the most part, there's no one in charge of the church that has that prophetic voice. Now, granted, there's some real loonies out there. I do believe that there are some real prophets out there, but you know as well as I do that if you believe in prophecy, many churches get the idea if somebody prophesies that that person is a prophet. That's the spirit of prophecy. And what I found was, you remember the playground out there, the people that were real judgmental and wanted to get everybody straightened out? Well, those same people showed up in the playground of the church with their defective personalities of wanting to control and wanting to be condemning and say they're speaking in the office of a prophet when all they were doing is just speaking out of their own nature that they had before. And they're passing judgments using... The office of a prophet. Because, the reason I say that because the spirit, <coughs> the spirit of prophecy, is for what? For edification and building up the church. And if the spirit, if the spirit of prophecy moves it, it's going to edify and build up the church. That's Jesus speaking to us, giving us words of encouragement, words of direction. The office of a prophet. God's hand-selected man came to bring judgment, first of all, to the priesthood, second of all, to the house of God, and third, to the kings, and fourth, to the people. The prophet didn't go to the people first. He always went to the leadership first and said, Thus saith the Lord God, get your eye cleaned up. It was not the spirit of prophecy that was there to edify. It was God speaking judgments against those who were supposed to be in charge of his government here on earth. And, and, and I, it, did you realize that the, the whole foundation of this great new city that ascends out of heaven, what's it built upon? It's built upon the foundation of the prophets and apostles. And if we throw out the giftings, if we throw out that five-fold ministry and say we don't believe in it, no wonder the world is going astray. Is there still are true men of God? They're not listened to. Mainstream denominations don't accept them. Most of Pentecostal don't accept them because you've got to come up through their ranks for, they, for them to recognize you. Most of the charismatics don't recognize them, but yet they got all this Elijah list and all that bunch of funny stuff. And then there's the Kundalini spirit that's entered the church which is a substitute mocking of the Holy Spirit of people going in all kinds of convulsions, barking dogs and lions and all that stuff. That's not prof that's not prophets, but we're talking we're talking holy prophets, and we're in the book of Revelation, and it's talking and the Lord God of the Holy Prophet sent. Most translations leave out the Spirit, instead it says the Holy Prophets. And it implies that there's still holy prophet. It implies that there's still holy prophet. It implies there's still holy prophets. Do you, you get that? And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels. Do, do you catch that? The office exists. That is one that is greatly abused and probably has the greatest list of imposters 
No, there's a greater list of imposters, and that's teachers. And scripture says there's not many teachers this day. There's not many teachers, but yet how many teachers is there? Every denomination has got a school of, well, let's get more teachers out there. Well, what are they teaching? A teacher, the definition of a teacher, I've given this to you on a personal level. I don't know if I've given it from the pulpit or not. Hezekiah, well, well no, you, 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 go to, you go over and you're going to climb, climb Mount Everest, and you come into town, and at the edge of town is Sally's Climbing School. And she's got a paper roll towel that's empty and focused up at the top and say, yeah, right up there, right up there. That's, I'll teach you how to get there. And you look around, there's no climbing equipment, there's no map. She's real f overweight. And she, she couldn't even climb the steps to get in there on time. And she's going to teach you how to get up there. Then you go down to Ted's climbing school and he's got a broken ski and a couple of ice cleats and a little hand scratching on a piece of paper. But a real telescope. Oh, look, focus, focus up there. It's right up there. I can get you there. What's the right question you should be asking? Do you go? Have you been there? When was the last time? That would be irrelevant. When was the last time you were there? It's been a hundred years since someone's been there. That's not a teacher, is it? If they've just been there once, that's not a teacher. You finally work down the road until you get to Hezekiah's climbing school. It don't open until 2 in the afternoon. And you're all frustrated. And he gets there. And it, well, how, what's the deal? How can we learn to climb? And he son, my school doesn't open because I go up and stand before the living God and do not come back down until he's finished with me. Now, do you want to learn how to do that? And he's got every piece of equipment there is. He runs you through physical fitness programs. He's got the maps laid out. He knows where all the crevices are. He knows where all the ice canyons are. He knows where all the things are. Most teachers today can't teach you how to get into the presence of God. They want to teach you something different. So there's a first qualification to the lowest guy on the rung, a teacher. And I could go on up the rung. Each one has some different things that it does. But one thing all of them have in common is they love the sheep. They love the smell of the sheep. They care for the sheep. They give their life for the sheep. They lay their life down for the sheep. They live with the sheep. They want to be with the sheep. And those teachers I meet just want to, I'll just teach. you got somebody else to care for the sheep. I'll just teach. That's not a teacher. So just like there's false prophets, there's also false teachers. And there's more false teachers, the reason I know that, is because without the office of a prophet, because it's been struck down already, the whole church is going astray. And who's leading it? False teachers. Because we've got itching ears and we just want to hear about new things that are in Scripture so that we can compare notes about Scripture and can hear notes about history. But is it getting you there? Are you having experiences with Him? Do you climb the mountain? The Holy Spirit came to put us in the presence of Jesus. The Holy Spirit came to teach us how to get into the presence of Jesus. And we need teachers that can teach us how to get in the presence of Jesus. And we can't settle for anything less. You'll die of thirst if you settle for something less. The problem is, is we put labels on everybody. Oh, that's a pastor, that's a pastor, that's a pastor. I've seen crud balls that needed to be put in prison. And they've got names on them because they go down in the street. And they say, ah, you know, Jesus. And they're blowing a horn out here and doing dope and selling dope and all that stuff. That is not a pastor. And I've seen men in pulpits that they're businessmen. They can't teach you how to get in God's presence because they don't get there, but they sure know how to run a business. God seems to think that, and the Lord God of the holy prophets, and this is way after everything, didn't say all the dead prophets, and it didn't say the spirit of the prophets because that's not in any other translations. It's just a word that was dropped in there. And the reason I'm bringing that out is because you can go read it. Oh, well, it was one translation that said, well, look in the Greek. And the Lord God of the Holy Prophet. So evidently at this time, the office still stands. And his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. 
Yeah, the problem with me telling you that that, that office exists, you're probably going to get visited within the next few days of somebody giving you a card saying, Holy Prophet, throw the card in the trash. <laughs> God's prophets don't go announce themselves. They have quiet and gentleness and meekness and truth. And this should be Mr. Incognito. And never self-exalted. The scripture says wherever selfish ambition is, every evil abounds. And something I saw happen in a charismatic church. Everybody wanted a gift. Everybody wanted to be on top. Who gave the best prophecy? Who did this best? Who's going to do that? Who's got the best teaching? And it was just selfish ambition that invaded, that run the Holy Spirit out of the midst. Because the Holy Spirit's supposed to move on who he wants. He's going to pick this person over there and that person over there and that person over there. And instead, everybody is, what's your gift? Oh, we've got to find out what our gift is. I'll tell you what my gift is. You know what it is? Jesus. Everything else, all of it belongs to him. All the gifts, everything belongs to him. And he's the one. Holy Spirit comes and distributes as he sees fit for bringing glory to Jesus Christ that no man should receive glory. If the 24 elders in heaven are throwing their crowns on the ground and falling on their faces when they are in charge of all the works of God, if we get used as a little instrument and the Holy Spirit won't even give us His name, we know Jesus' name, we know God the Father's name, but the Holy Spirit won't even give it His name. If we're going to move in the Holy Spirit, how much more should we be insignificant and Mr. Incognito if He is? But yet the gifts of the Spirit are real. The manifestations are needed. They're purposeful. They're commanded. Not advised that, well, you might do this. They were commanded to go to Jerusalem and wait that they would receive power from on high. But not for the self-centered garbage that we see today, nor the self-glorification, for the sanctification of the church. For the operation of the church, you realize what? of word, receiving a word that is really valid from Jesus about the facts of something in the future that affects my life. I need that breath from him and I can't get that from somebody that just likes to orate scripture. Matter of fact, it says in scripture that a mind of a man not filled with the spirit can't understand scripture. It says he can be filled with the spirit of Jesus and it talks about us being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the reason I'm going into this is because if we're talking about holy prophets, we also need to talk about who, what kind of hat do they wear? What do they look like? For God has done, he's, he's validating them one last time and still making the statement in the very closing scenes that, that they're there. If they're there then, you think they're here now. And I've seen so much error, it almost embarrasses me to talk about it. But how can I not talk about it when it's supposed to be the lifeline? Do you realize, I've made this statement before, got to make it again. In Europe, for a thousand years, the Bible was used to kill about 50 million people. Maybe as much as 100 million people. The Bible was used. And most of the Europeans say, get that piece of trash out of our nation. It caused the death of half of our nation. Get it out. Well, there's a bunch of fools running around mimicking gifts, claiming positions, claiming titles, claiming teachings, and they are discrediting the Holy Spirit, the only one that can lead us into the presence of God. The only one. And if there was such a thing as a prophet, I hope you think that there is, I do. One would they even raise their head up and let you know that they were. But if the Holy Spirit's been discredited, all they would do is discredit it all the more. Although I do know of some, and they're quiet and gentle. I consider John one of those that's come into our mess before. Meekest man I've ever met in my life, John Castile. He was going to show something. These are the words. These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. The angel 
is showing his servants things. But if there's prophets, prophets see also things that are going to take place in the future. How do you think the church gets led out away from all the chaos that takes place when we begin to go through the tribulation? Remember we looked and in chapter 14 Jesus finally shows up for the rapture right before the bowls of wrath are poured out when the last trumpet is blown. And we've got to go through that. Who's going to lead us through that? Do you think a false teacher is going to lead us to that? Somebody went to seminary and lead us to that? We need a man that goes up to the mountain and talks to God to know where to go. We need a man that's proven and tried in his character and his nature and his lifestyle and everything that he does and everything that he said that's watched with a mic microscope. We need a man that when he speaks, we know that's the word of God. We need something that comes from there because we're going to need it at that time to avoid taking that mark. But it says we're led out into the desert and springs. Well, who's, who's going to lead us? Who's going to lead us? Food for thought for you. But I love it that he said these things which must shortly take place. Boy, I'm thinking, hey, you got a different watch than I do? <laughs> it's a long time down here, Lord. <laughs> he said, well, you're a blade of grass. Besides that, if you don't see me come, you're going to die. It's, it's a short time. You don't have many years left. It's a short time. These things will come to pass shortly. Why? Because you close your eyes when you're death. You're already at the end of eternity. You don't go to heaven right off the bat. I think you know that. You do go to be with Jesus, though. And what we've been looking at, this new heaven, this new earth, the new, the new cosmos... That's the heaven we're going to be living in. Forever and ever and ever. It's not contaminated. And we won't be contaminated if we work with them. Revelation 3, 14 and 15. And the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness. Who is that? That's Jesus. He's the Amen. Amen says, Let it be so. He's still letting it be so, whatever the Father's will is. But he's faithful to that, and he's true to that, and he's a witness to what the Father says, and he's a witness to carry it out. And he was the beginning of creation of God. I know your words, that you're neither hot nor cold, and I could wish that you were cold or hot. I find that one of the biggest tragedies within the body of Christ is that we, we grow cold. We go cold. My daughter called me and she went down for a vacation and she's on the Oregon coast and she called me last night. It's freezing down here. <laughs> I thought it'd be like the Gulf. I thought I'd be walking on the beach and the sun would be baking me. And I said, no, honey, it's the Oregon coast. I uh... said, well, when will it warm up? I said, what's the temperature? 70. I said, well, it's there. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Said, well, I'm freezing to death. And I said, well, you know, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm walking in the water barefoot. And I said, what, well, you know, once you go into one of those used shops like the Goodwill and find you some of those diver socks and put them on your feet. She said, yeah. And she's in a tent. And I said, well, why don't you go down to one of those thrift stores and buy you a heater right now. It's uh, summertime and you probably get one for four bucks. And said, well, yeah, why did I think of that? And, then, and I said, oh, yeah, while you're there, why don't you look for a down, coveter, a down feather comforter? Yeah. The reason I'm telling you that, she's not ignorant. She just hadn't lived in that part of the country before. She don't know. She can teach you some things of how to stay cool in hot weather, but she can't teach you some things about how to stay warm in cold climate because she's never experienced that. All His Spirit and His teachers and His prophets can teach us those things that we do not know so that we can walk in it and enjoy it and love it. So, are you hot or cold? If you're cold... Jesus wants to spew you out of his mouth, but the point is, he says, I'm, I'm the one that's faithful, and I'm the one that's true. And I love him making that statement, because I know my own nature, and I know my own character, and I can tell you, many say, oh, you're such a faithful person. And I look at him, and I no, I'm not. No, I'm not. There's no one faithful but him. No one. No one. There's no one good but him. There's no good thing but him. There's nothing but Him. Everything else is just like we are. We are stuck in this human body, but He wanted us stuck in this human body 
to be his representative, wanted us stuck in this human body so that we could grow in him and his faithfulness by the power of the Spirit that's resurrecting that mortal body from death of the recognition of Jesus as Lord in our lives. And the Holy Spirit wants to raise us into that position of life. And he wants to enable us to become faithful. He wants to enable us to have truth in our hearts. And He wants to enable us to be truthful with each other and care for one another and love for one another. He's the only one that can do that. Some areas, with His help, I have made many strides. But, as I walk along in my life, sometimes I see a pit that I haven't made strides and I have just learned to walk around it. I look forward to the day that I can walk across the top of that and not fall in. Jesus is the only one that can keep us from doing that. Revelation 19, 11, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. There again, Jesus is the only one that's faithful and true in this deal. You are not, I am not. And Verse 7, chapter 22, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Do you realize when we started this book, in chapter 1, verse 3, it said that there's a blessing for whoever reads this. Now it says there's a blessing for whoever, whoever keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now it's also done something else. It's automatically set this book aside that every word in it is prophecy from Jesus. It's the only book of the Bible that was handwritten by Jesus. It was taken in dictation. His letter of love to us and his directives to us. The rest of them, he moved on men. Here, he's speaking directly to us. Not in metaphors. He said, behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecies of this book. Are you a keeper of the words of the prophecies of this book? Because it's filled. I count 2,236 projections of being connected to Old Testament reference prophecies that are brought back to life in the midst of this that brings them into role with this. And I find, am I, am I a keeper of these things? Am I a keeper of these things? Well, I found one the other day. I said, Whoa, I didn't know I wasn't doing that. <laughs> it shook me. I thought, oh my goodness. Revelation 22 and 8. Now, I, John, saw and heard these things. He's testifying right now. I physically saw these things. I physically heard these things. Because I, you know, I've heard some theologians say, ah, he was just kind of dreaming and floating around in space in his head. And, and he kind of woke up and yawned and he ate the wrong thing. And he makes a statement. I saw these things. They were physical. They were real. And when I heard and saw, I fell down and worshipped at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. That's how real it was. He, he, he fell down physically in front of the angel. We're not in the spiritual realm. We're in a physical realm right now. And which, did you realize that right now, that side of God, the heavens where he's at and Jesus is at and all that stuff, it appears spiritual to us, right? When the new heaven and new earth is made, it's no longer spiritual. It's physical. Everything in it's physical. There's nothing in it spiritual. It's physical that we walk in, we live in, we move in, everything in it, we're connected in it. It's physical. And all of this stuff passes away. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Do not seal up the words. I, I don't know how many denominations have ruled this book out as plausible. Martin Luther said it stunk. It had no meaning. It was rhetorical. It had no prophetic value. It had no value from God. It had no value from the Holy Spirit. It, and, and, I, and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. What has been proven in third world countries, when they get a new convert, you know what the first book they take them to is? This book. 
It brings the reality of Jesus. It brings them to their feet. It brings them to their knees. It brings the reality of God. They fall on their face. They worship God. And when they read one of the other books, it's just a little instructional book. This book is the inspirational, revelational of, oh, Jesus, this is how you react. This is who you are. We expect you to come. We expect you to heal. We expect you to do something. And Father, you sit on the throne. But for the most part in the church, it's the last one that anybody wants to hear because it brings a grave responsibility that we have a duty to our living God to live for Him, desire Him, thirst for Him, love Him, and become His children and be busy about His business instead of ours. In our next session, we're going to take up verse 11, which has some serious connotations in it. I hope you join us for that. Because it's got some weird stuff in it. Let him who does wrong still do wrong. Ah, why would God say that? Prepare your hearts for action and your minds for action and the visitation of the Spirit. Dedicate yourself to putting this book in your heart because it is pure prophecy. And what is prophecy? The voice of Jesus. And it will, it will reckon within you the voice of the living God so that you, you will be absolutely comfortable with everything that's said in it, but it will bring to life the rest of it. Because without the revelation of Jesus, without the revelation through the Holy Spirit, everything else is quiet. It's just words. We need it given to us. The gospel is revelation from God. Remember chapter, I think it was 19, maybe 18, we had the gospel being preached for the last time. No, it was 13. And an angel came to preach the gospel. Preach the revelation. Jesus is real. Jesus is God. Bow down, worship him. Do not take the mark of the beast. The gospel is revelational, it's factual, and it's to the point of how we're supposed to be relevant to God. It gives the world the command, be relevant to me. Instead of the church today, which says we must be relevant to the world. If we choose to be relevant to the world instead of God, we have chosen the wrong path. We must be relevant to God in order to get the world to come to Him, not vice versa. Shall we worship the Lord?